Uh, good to see you again. Chip and uh, hello, everybody else. Right. Bear with us a second while we pull up all the windows that we need uh, for this business. Um, there we go. Hope everybody can hear us. Um, so a uh, couple of things. I have a parish notice before we get started. Uh, after we've finished um, uh, talking, um, I think what we're going to do is stick around. And if people want to turn their, their cameras on, we can at least wave at each other. Uh, in little rectangles on our respective uh, laptop screens and uh, pretend that we've got a glass of wine and maybe a cheese and a sausage on a stick or something like that. So there is a little social thing afterwards if folk uh, can make it to that. We're going to talk for about um, 45 minutes um, and you just heard a very quick uh, introduction to my uh, my guest, uh, Chip Colbert. Um, couple of things really i've always found it really useful when i've been at events um that we've had perspectives from people outside of our industry and honestly i don't think you can get more outside of our in industry uh than a combat veteran so i'm really interested we had a great conversation uh just over the weekend actually as we were putting together this uh this chat i was i was fascinated um, by uh, Chip's background and his experiences. Um, and it was just genuinely fascinated. He, uh, one of the things that wasn't mentioned, by the way, was uh, he worked under the Obama administration uh, for a while. So I'm sure there's things there. What I would like to do to start off with, uh, I have lots of questions and I've got them written down here. I also have the Q&A open and I also have the chat open. But really, um, this really comes to life if those of you out there in virtual land have also got questions for Chip. So I'm going to be keeping my eyes open. I want to start, though, actually, um, you're a West Point graduate, 20 years in the military. Please take some time and tell us about your experiences of how you've come from being a West Point graduate to where you are today because i i found it a fascinating story last week when you were telling me so that's my first question what have you been up to for the last however many years <laughs> thanks david i think um yeah uh, one great to great to be on with everybody and uh, and thank you uh for asking me to participate today um to come to the question i think you know for me it, it's really all about mission um and and meaning and I think, you know, as we think about leadership of organizations and that idea of, you know, providing people with meaning as a driving force um, for, for your, for your, for your membership or, you know, for your, uh, for your employees, what have you, uh, that is really what I think that has been kind of the theme for me is, you know, as a young uh, young child, I was very motivated by the idea of serving something uh, bigger than myself. I, I knew I wanted to go into public service. I came from somewhat of a military family. Uh, most of the folks in my, uh, in my, uh, you know, my, my uncles, my dad, they had done some sort of some form of stint in, uh, in either in the military or in other means of public service. So from a young age, knew I knew I wanted to go that route. Um, went to West Point, uh, despite the objections of my mother, who did not did not want me to go to a service academy. Uh, but I was very focused on on going that route. Um, and then, you know, went into the infantry, uh, did all the kinds of things that you do as a as an army infantry officer. Um, you know, deployed to uh, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and and you know was part of that. Uh, the the sort of you know that ongoing uh, campaign and deployments, and I think you know for me coming out of my second deployment to Iraq, I was really focused around why like decision making right like senior leader decision making, and I was just really captured on like how the heck did national security decision making result in sort of these tactical actions on the ground of which I was a part right, and so I made a decision, um, I, I actually came close a, a couple of times to, to leaving service um, because, you know, demands on your family and, and all the things that <laughs> that go along with uh, serving your country, especially in a time of war. But ultimately it was that idea of mission and meaning that I, that I wanted to stay involved. I wanted to stay sort of in that world, but I wanted to take a different path. And so I, elected to leave the infantry and I went into a career fields called strategic policy and planning where 
I had the opportunity to work for some senior level folks um, and and wound up working at the Obama administration National Security Council um, 2013 to 2016, really looking at Middle East defense policy and how are those senior level strategic decisions made and how do they then translate um, you know, to, to the actions that, that, that we take as a, as a country and as, as an armed forces. Um, and then again, you know, as I was coming to the end of my time there, uh, I was, you know, said, okay, I'm done. I'm done with defense and national security. I have, you know, it's time to go do something different. And so I went private sector, went totally, kind of took a hard transition um, and went totally entrepreneurial, totally private sector focused, uh, focused around sort of organizational development, leader development type work. And about a year, 18 months into that, I enjoyed the heck out of myself, but realized something was missing. Um, and had kind of a, a moment in the mirror uh, and, and said, what, you know, I've got a good thing going, right? Like I've got more time with my family. I'm, you know, coaching my kids in sports. I'm doing work that I want to do as opposed to work I'm being told to do. But ultimately it was, I missed that sense of mission, that sense of meaning. And so I started getting back uh, slowly into kind of that defense focused work around emerging technology. And then uh, about two years ago, I encountered the founding team of Rebellion Defense, where I am now, and we're at a you know technology for national security focused company, um, and you know the the sense of meaning and and mission uh, here is phenomenal for me, uh, and I'm you know we're working with great people um, and enjoying the heck out of it, uh, and so that's you know that's kind of where I am where I am today. If that was what you're looking for, David. Yeah, yeah, br brilliant. Okay, uh, I see we've got a couple of questions coming in. I'm going to come to those in a minute. I actually want to go um, uh, back, though. Um, obviously, you're in the Obama administration. You're working on national security. I think when we were talking uh, last week, you sort of alluded to the fact that you, you've been in the room where various decisions have been taken. And we were having a conversation about, you know, the formal and the informal things that, that, that happen in those spaces. So coming back to your point about being a, a person, you know, in, in combat um wondering how decisions have get taken can you expand a bit uh in whatever way you are able to in in how those decisions translate from being in those rooms presumably in in dc or or wherever it may be and then what happens there and then how does it translate out to the to the to the uh to the places where those decisions take effect in the real world yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, I, I'm just, I've always been fascinated by how, like, just how I'm kind of an organizational development nerd, if you will, that I just am always uh, interested in how do organizations arrive at decisions and, and what are the formal processes and what are the informal processes, right? And, and you, you know, if you look at, especially like for the U.S. national security sort of apparatus, there is a very deliberate, very formal process through which decisions are, are elevated, right? Because, you know, like as General Matt, I was working for General Mattis when he was at CENTCOM and he once said to me, right, like, yeah, if, if decisions were easier, they would have ne never have gotten to my level, right? So, so you know, at every, at every organizational level, right, you're, you're looking, do you have the authority to make that decision? And do you have all the facts and all the information that you need to make that decision. And ideally, if the answer to those two questions are yes, then at a lower level, that issue is, is you know, resolved and it never continues to go higher. But there, you know, strategic level, uh, you know, decisions with, with weighty consequences and, <laughs> right, like they're gonna continue to, to escalate. And I think, you know, watching the formal process play out and how decisions are teed up, how they work their way through sort of the first you know, policy committee layer to the deputies committee, to the principals committee, and ultimately to a national security council meeting where you know, the president is chairing that meeting and the decisions that are you know, sort of teed up and how those are articulated and, and all the things that go into making that sort of a decision. And then you know, also being very conscious of, okay, you know, there are things that are discussed a part of that formal process. And then there may be decisions that are made that you know weren't necessarily part of that formal process, or you know, and I think that's true, right? In every organization, no matter where you, where you're working, is you know there could be a, a, a committee level meeting, and then ultimately the decision that is made is not what was discussed at that formal process, right? Um, 
And then what I and what I think is interesting about that, especially in sort of the you know the national security uh, instance, but again for any organization, is then if the decision you know for you as a stakeholder in the organization or in that process, if the decision that is made is different than what you recommended or what you argued stridently against potentially, how then do you take ownership right of that decision and and how as the senior leader of whatever organization you're in if you do go that route right like how do you still achieve the buy-in of those people that are then going to go out and execute that decision right because i think that i think is is like what i you know i when i was a young company commander right i always used to bring in my and this work and this is work for me in the military and it's no different in the private sector right is you know, as you're thinking about, if you're the decision maker, you're thinking about teeing up a decision, bring folks in, solicit ideas from the organization, because the, the knowledge is probably already extant within your people, and listen more than you, you know, more than you speak. And then that's not to abdicate the responsibility for making the decision, right? But I think if you solicit that input, you then, when you make that decision, if it, you know, if it isn't what somebody argued for, if they were a part of that process and they have visibility into how the decision was made, I think their willingness to go out and then carry out that decision is, is that much more, right? That you get that ownership and buy-in. Uh, and I think that applies at the macro level and it applies down to the smallest of teams, right? Absolutely. I, I wish now I could look out over to an audience because I, I suspect there'd be a lot of people nodding and smiling to themselves at the idea of going, how did we end up with this decision from the conversation that we had previously? Um, <laughs> I, I suspect that's quite universal. I know we've got a couple of questions there. I, I have one because you, you talked about different layers of counsel, um, uh, and obviously different sort of decision uh, making layers. And Anne, who uh, sadly can't be with us now, she's had to go off and do other things, but she was giving a keynote earlier about organisation and uh, methods of organization there. So I've got a, a genuinely a very quick question, a lot of layers here. Actually, how fast can a decision come in at the bottom, get to the whatever level it needs to get to, and then come back down again? Because I would imagine those are all pressure situations, right? Nobody, nobody's, nobody's really got time. So just how fast does that happen? Yeah, I think it, it you know, it can happen very fast, right? If, if the situation warrants, right? And I, I think as a, as a um, you know, the two sort of things, I think as the, as the senior level decision maker to think about are risk and time, right? So like how, if there's a decision that can, you know, if it's a high level of risk and, you know, it's, it's a short period of time, you probably as the leader need to hold that decision at your level, right? That's something you're not going to no. want to, take a committee approach. And it might be one of those instances where it's just like, hey, you know what, like the consequences of this are such and the timeline is such that I'm, you know, this is just on me. This is what we're doing, right? Yeah. And I think when you, when the risk and time are both lesser, I think taking that approach of getting the buy-in, you know, working, the, taking a more deliberate approach to your organizational decision-making, I think that's where you can build that institutional sort of prowess, if you will, or right, like at how, how do we like effectively make decisions through a, a, a collaborative process, right? Recognizing that, yeah, there may always be those times where risk and time is is high and, and low, right? Um, yeah. Where we're not gonna be able to do that. But I think the more you you do it, right, the, the faster you can can get at it and if and, and you can you, you know use the process if, if appropriate. And again, if you're using that process and then there is the situation where you don't have time to use the process, I think people are happy, like they have that much more trust in you as the decision maker, right? That yep. it's not going to be that reaction of like, well, where the heck did this come from, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've got one. I'm going to I'm going to build the two together. So we had, I think it was Yadu asking, you know, mental shifts to work in the private sector and transition. And I know that was something we, we, we talked about. I, I we, I'll say we were having this conversation, putting this chat together last week, and I, I was reflecting in the IET, in the IT department at the IET, we often make a statement which, which is nobody dies if we get this wrong. Um, and I'm very aware that in your world, right, that is not true. 
there are situations where clearly people's lives there are real and just incredibly different consequences to the types of decisions the ramifications to the decisions we take so i'm interested we've already talked about it a bit i know but you know the similarities and the differences right in, in that decision making process given the ramifications the, the the consequences that come from those and then following that right yadi's question you know the mental shift of moving to the private sector your experiences of doing that and your reflections on that mm -hmm. yeah the great question i think i think one i think you know the i would sum up in terms of a leadership perspective right is I think the idea of you know the mil the stereotypical military leadership style is command and control, very directive, very you will do this because I am in charge, right? Um, and I think it, and, and for for me, I I honestly never that that has never been my approach, right? I I, I early on, you know, I I I, have, I think and maybe again coming back to my my family history of folks in the military. You know, my dad had, had said to me, he was a, a enlisted a Marine Corps um, uh, during his, his stay. And he was like, hey, if you're going to go in as an officer, like you may want to listen to your your NCO, your non-commissioned officers and your soldiers, because they're probably going to be able to help you out. Right. And so I think I always tried to take the approach of leading through influence and persuasion as opposed to a command and control and directive sort of authoritarian um kind of approach and i you know that so the transition leadership wise for for me into the private sector has not been difficult because i think that works or it has worked for me very well over the past five and a half years in a private sector setting of of coming from that approach right i, I think i told you david one of my yeah. first uh platoon sergeants when i was a young officer there was a squad leader that was struggling for us and you know he pulled the squad leader in to counsel him and i was kind of just sitting there observing and i'll never forget he said you know son and he was from texas so he spoke in that like awesome drawl and he said son you know good lord gave you two ears and one mouth if you use them in that ratio you're going to probably be okay right and so i think coming from that sort of uh mindset i think the transition hasn't been tremendously difficult um because I think that's, you know, I think that's the best, the way you get like the best results from a team, the way you build that trust, the way you really get to become a high performing team together. I think coming back to your point around the stakes, right? I actually, I struggled um, because I think people tend to look from the outside in and say, wow, military, you know, life and death on the line, literally. And right, like I've been in those situations, but it, like for, for me and those when I was in those situations, I felt I, you know, you've got the training, you've done the reps, and it's very like you just kind of go into it like a okay, this is the mission, this is what we have to do, um, and and so you, right, like you, you, it's just your reality, like you just deal with it. Where I actually struggled really, you know, had a really difficult time was when I transitioned the private sector. Um, I had a, a person working for me that just didn't what that just was not working out and we you know put them on a performance improvement plan and we you know tried to do all the right things and I was sitting down with them and giving them feedback and we got them a coach and you know we, we put a lot of resources towards trying to make it work for this person and it just didn't and when I had to sit down across from him and tell him you know, you're, you're done with the organization and, you know, we need you to kind of, you know, find another opportunity. When I had to fire, like let someone go in the private sector, that was like really difficult for me because what I kept coming back to is in the private sector, the stakes are high because that person doesn't have a, 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 a way, you know, doesn't have livelihood waiting for them, right? In the military, if you have, if something doesn't work out and you need to let somebody go from your unit, unless it's really egregious, right? They're not actually leaving service. You're not kicking them out of the military. So, so I actually found the stakes to be a little bit higher and more uncomfortable uh, in taking hard personnel actions in the private sector. Brilliant. Um, if anybody else wants to put some comments in the chat or whatever, or ask questions, please do. I, um, I've got another one. So uh, Yadu has referenced you working with uh, General Martin uh, Dempsey and talking about 
uh, leadership caliber and behavior. And I must admit, I'm not familiar with General Dempsey, um, but I'd imagine he's a special person. I, I was interested, we were, we were Anne again was, was talking about um, leadership, a different models of organization. And um, she was modeling a sort of, uh, very hard to describe in a few minutes without the aids of all the slides, but it was a sort of bubbles model when people were organized, funnily enough, around focus and goals and objectives rather than a traditional hierarchy. That's a super high level summary of what she was, she was talking about. As I was listening to her and reflecting on, on, on our chat, I remember, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Have you, have you read, do you know, Turn the Ship Around by no, no. Um, uh, David, is it David Marquis, the submarine mm -hmm. commander? Yeah. yeah, I'm familiar so, with it. Yeah, so, so I read that book. And, and to everybody else out there, if you've not read that book, go read that book, right? I, I don't normally say this because I'm a cynical man when it comes to business books and the rest of it but genuinely turn the ship around it's a brilliant youtube video um but yeah so you know i'm interested obviously you went to west point what have been your observations in terms of leadership caliber and behavior similarities and differences again in in sort of approaches because it's not Certainly, I would suggest in the civilian world, people don't often get promoted to be managers in charge of people because they're good at leadership. There are lots of other reasons why they end up in the places that they are. So I'd be fascinated by your, your thoughts and observations uh, there and, and referencing yeah, uh, Yadi's question as well. Yeah, uh, brilliant, brilliant question. I think, you know, I've, I firmly believe that leadership must be taught, right? I think there, you know, people say, well, is, you know, that person a born leader or a natural leader, or I think leadership is something that has to be studied. And I think the reason like, and, and look, you know, in the military, you know, we spend a tremendous amount of time focused around leadership, uh, studying leadership, practicing leadership, you know, developing uh, junior leaders, right. And I think, even with the amount of time that we spend, you're always going to have those folks that are, you know, that like toxic leadership is a very real thing, right? <laughs> Even yep. in organizations that take a very deliberate approach to developing their leaders, right? And so I think one, you know, the, the knee jerk reaction, there's a phenomenal, um, I think it was an HBR article I read in grad school when I was, when I was focusing on organizational psychology and leader development called uh, stepping up to fail, right? And it looked at why, you know, when organizations promote people, and this was, I think was uh, specifically looking at CEOs, why do people that take on a leadership role fail? And one of the key findings was they, they tend to fall back on the skill sets that made them successful or got them to the point of promotion, which aren't necessarily the skill sets that you're going to need if you're going to step into a leadership role and managing others, right? And I think, you know, we as organizations tend to say, or, you know, hey, you, you're a great individual contributor. You're doing whatever function it is in this organization so well that we are now going to promote you and give you leadership responsibility over the rest of this team uh, and take you out of that kind of individual contributor role without having a conversation with that person, whether or not they are interested in managing people or in being a leader, right? And, and then, you know, all too often without helping that individual prepare or, you know, think about how they need to step into that role of leadership, right? So I think that's the biggest, you know, or the biggest insight I would offer is, you know, if as an organization, if you're thinking about promoting somebody, if you want somebody to take on leadership role, one, have the conversation with them if that's something that they want to do, or if they're very happy, you know, staying in their individual contributor role, right? And there's nothing wrong with either one of those decisions, right? Like if somebody wants to be a phenomenal IC and is good at their job and is happy doing that job, leave them in there, you know, leave them yeah. where they're happy and being successful, right? Like, um, and then if there's a conversation that says, hey, you know, yeah, I'm, you're, you think I'm the right person, I want to do this, then having that conversation around what are kind of your gaps, where, what are the things that you need that we as an organization need to equip you with to be successful, right? In the military, every, almost every role 
you know, this, you know, that you that you move into, there is some sort of preparation phase to kind of get you ready for that opportunity, right? And I think that's why, you know, people tend to say like, oh, look at these military leaders, like what great examples of leadership? Well, there's a ton of development and work that go into that, right? And even then we still get it wrong, right? There's still people that fall through the cracks. And I would say, if you identify like toxic leadership, like if you identify somebody in the organization that's toxic, like you can't, as the the senior person, you can't whistle your way past that. You got to deal with that, right? Like. Uh, that is yeah. damaging. Uh, absolutely. And, and I find that interesting because I think, uh, speaking personally, I've had exactly one course on leadership uh, in, in my career. And I don't know if there's anybody who wants to put in, in, in comments, because I think that will resonate with a lot of people as to that, that thing strikes me, right? That the, the military angle being, well, if we're going to put you in charge of a bunch of people, you're going to have some training on how to be in charge of a bunch of people. And and although I think we talk about it in 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 other organisations, I I it doesn't sound to me, I say like this, there's, there's anything in terms of the same sort of formalisation of a of a learning and development. Uh, professional development role, but I'll be interested to see if anybody else wants to come back on me and go, well, no, actually we did it differently. So I should, I should put that back out there and, and see what comes back out. What, well, go on, we're, go ahead. Can, yeah. So we're Please. actually, you know, in my current, you know, startup company, we're two years old, 160 ish people. Now, just last week, we were having a conversation around, you know, we need to, <laughs> Hey, we should probably think about, you know, quarterly conversations and you know performance reviews and how are we going to do that and like one of the things I immediately jumped to was well if we're going to institute performance reviews and put that responsibility on our management team to to have those you know difficult conversations we probably ought to have a uh, some curriculum around how do you have a difficult conversation right and like there's a tremendous body of work out there around how you give feedback in a way that is actually heard and received and is seen as developmental as opposed to you know just telling somebody what you know everything that they're doing wrong and so as a, like as a company where we are now saying okay cool like we're going to get all of our managers together and we're going to you know have a book club and we're going to talk about difficult conversations and giving effective feedback right so you know i, I think it is very much a um you know, there's the organizational component and then there's the individual component. It's brilliant. We're getting some comments coming in. So um, let me have a look. They're flying up. Right. So I was fortunate enough to have some coaching in courses, but the rest of the company constantly made fun of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the only training I had was how to do performance reviews. I never had any training on day to day management and how common is this situation? Anyone else had the same experience? Um, and uh, some bigger corps in uh, Germany here have uh, leadership development programs. So yeah, that's that's just a flavour. I say, were we were we together in a room? I, I, I suspect we'd be having a you know a come to Jesus moment on this one. It's just a feeling I've got. You've talked about rebellion, and you've talked about the fact that you're in a startup and you and you're growing. So I want to sort of move on to the, the next area because again, I think there's some really uh, fascinating things um again folks when we had our conversation i wrote down the software era of defense and um and again was talking about data and analytics and we had some questions earlier about where the world of, of scholarly and associated publishing uh, was in terms of analytics um, and all the rest of that and 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 chip is what were you employee number 12 i think it was for, for re rebellion, so re rebellion uh, defense is, um, I had to practice saying that, I uh, can't tell you how difficult it was, um, is, is, is working on the whole sort of software and analytics and bringing that to the world of, of the defense of our, of our nations. Uh, rebellion defense work uh, for the UK uh, uh, security apparatus as much as they work for the US, I believe. So, Take us through that again. I suspect we probably all have some views that are either cliched or generated via Hollywood. So either you've got all of the um, surveillance satellites in the world able to read people's mobiles, phones from 20,000 miles up at any moment in time, um, or 
alternatively the fog of war and all of that stuff so rebellion defense what are you trying to do uh your thoughts on some of the issues and and, and chip uh we had a conversation about something that actually made the news in 2014 that really i think stuck with your mind so i don't know if you want to start there with, yeah. with, with that conversation but talking about real world things about when you get data wrong boy does he have an anecdote chip yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, I think, you know, so Rebellion Defense, right, it's, we're really about, you know, kind of building software for the mission of defense and national security, AI, ML, kind of where appropriate, right? Um, uh, and and I think there, there really is a, a recognition in the defense organizations, national security apparatus, you know, UK and, and US alike, that this the the you know sort of hardware defined error um, and and this focus on large expensive platforms um, that that you know as, as technology proliferates as sensors proliferate right like data is sort of the new coin of the realm if you will and that that you know we're really thinking about this software defined error of of defense and so that and and why that mission is personally you know so compelling to me. The incident um, David just mentioned is when I was at the National Security Council, um, I was there when when we U.S. forces uh, mistakenly struck a Doctors Without Borders uh, field hospital uh, and killed a you know a bunch of of non-combatant civilians um, because you know despite the Hollywood uh, depiction of 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 uh, you know offensive operations military operations like Clausewitz still very much rules the day and fog friction and chance on the battlefield are, you know, the, the, the Hollywood image of how warfare is conducted and being on the ground, um, <laughs> vastly different. And it's still messy. It's still chaotic. It, you know, like it, it's, it's not anywhere near the ideal that you see on the screen. And the, the incident where at the Doctors Without Borders incident, I wound up kind of focusing on some policy work uh, around civilian casualty mitigation and, and how do you, you know, cr promote conversations between NGOs like Doctors Without Borders, Medicine Sans Frontiers, um, and, and, the, and the government uh, and government forces, that kind of thing. And for me, that like when I left service, I stayed, you know, sort of in that space around civilian casualty mitigation because, you know, it, it's it's just a you know it personally very meaningful compelling for me and i think when i first met the rebellion defense team and started kind of understanding what it is we were trying to do uh, and specifically how we were trying to you know kind of use computers to help this human analysts and decision makers make better decisions um in in the you know in, on the battlefield you know, for me, that idea of, of being a part of a team that was doing positive work that could, you know, ensure that incidents like the Doctors Without Borders, uh, you know, disaster doesn't happen. Um, that is is part of a huge, you know, that's a big part of my why for for why I'm, I'm here at Rebellion. Um, and so, the, you know, this work, like coming back to mission and meaning, like this is this is where it's at for me. <laughs> Uh, for a number of reasons. And so Rebe Rebellion's trying to, am I right in, in a, I, I feel like I'm about to do a sort of Prince Charles member of the royal family. So what is it that you do? Um, but if, if, <laughs> I think you're trying to pull data sets together, right? And and then you talk about the big platform. So I'm presuming you're talking things like, you know, aircraft carriers and, you know, planes and tanks mm -hmm. and, and, and things like that. So I, I've got a few you're trying to bring a variety of data to bear to those hardware systems, uh, presumably so they could be either deployed more effectively or perhaps not deployed at all, um, uh, I guess. So a couple of things there. Um, we had a talk earlier on, um, American Psychological Association um, moving into the cloud and, and all the rest of it. Um, Last week, for those of us in the UK, briefly it disappeared. There was a, there was a bit of a, a, a news report about um, MPs in the UK um, getting a bit uptight about the fact that uh, GCHQ, I believe, has just struck a deal with AWS. Um, 
because GCHQ, like anybody else, needs access to very large amounts of compute power and they need it on tap when they need it. And what are you going to do? You're going to go to cloud operation. So I, I'm, I'm interested from the defense perspective, again, we, we talked about this uh, last week, where are they in terms of bringing the benefits of the clouds to bear to this area? And, and what's been your experience? I mean, you're using it in Rebellion, I believe. Right, yep, so we're, we're a cloud cloud first company, right? So that, that's kind of where we're doing all of our, uh, all of our development. And I think w when you look at, um, again, defense, both, both US and, and UK, I think there, there is like, it's happening, right? Like the recognition of the need to move to the cloud for a variety of reasons is there. Um, we, in the US, the DOD had done a, a, a very large uh, cloud contract, which of course fell into sort of you know lawsuits and, and mitigation, um, because it was they they were initially going towards a, a single cloud opportunity, and now I think they're reopening that back up. It's going to be a multi cloud sort of thing. So I think the the movement to the cloud is already happening and is is continuing to to head that way. I think where it gets um, interesting and and you know infinitely harder is. Is you know that sort of the they talk about the the swap environment, the uh, size, weight, and power constrained environment, sort of the the cloud at the edge, right? Um, right. For deployed in, uh, in uh, units, limited bandwidth, limited connectivity. Um, so that is something that we're you know we as a company are are working through uh, with DoD as they struggle or not struggle, but as they figure that out, right? And yeah. I think that's you know the the much of the conversation that you see is like ongoing right now is is like okay how does this work in the edge use case how does this work in a yeah. in the secure classified use case right so uh but yeah i think very much so uh the movement to the cloud is is ongoing and what's been the you know again in terms of we, we had some stuff about people you know change transformation are you able to talk at all about you know uh how fast did the DOD or whoever come to the table in terms of accepting cloud as a, as, as a necessary uh, condition for continued success? Was it was it a struggle, or actually did they get there quite quite quickly? Yeah, no, I think it's still a, a, a struggle, right? I, I, to an extent, I think, and and right now, I think. Uh, primarily around sort of that last point that I was referencing in terms of like the edge and the swap environment, et cetera. I think the other thing, you know, early on was very much um, the idea of the security of the cloud, I think was, was something that was very much a question, right? That like, there is still this mindset of like, well, on-prem is, is more secure than, you know, storage in the cloud. Um, and I think, you know, like any topic, right? I, th I think there's still, you know, there there <laughs> there's still strong opinions uh, on on a lot of that. But I, you know, I was at a conference last week where uh, they were talking about the, you know, one of our the Defense Information Systems Agency was talking about a the, this large uh, sort of enterprise wide cloud uh, contract that they're that they're uh, pursuing or opening up for bid or is currently uh, you know in bid I'm not I'm not sure where it actually stands but um, so yeah I, I mean I think it's we're headed that way I think there's still some convincing that needs to occur uh, that kind of thing hey, Ken I think um, Ken was asking if there's a sort of general philosophical point to think about whether all applications are suitable for the cloud, whether that's truism. Uh, I, I, I personally suspect that it will come to a point when you will need a very good reason as to why you don't put your stuff in, in the cloud, however you set it up, because the cloud covers so, so many different things. You know, the AWS cloud for GCHQ ain't nothing like the cloud that we're using at the IET, I can tell you that, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, but it, it, it is about that combination of both centralization and, and uh, also the decentralization of resources because we're all using a bit of the overall resource when we're in the cloud. So I, I think, um, uh, I, this personally at least, I think that's where the, the journey is going. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you need commute, compute on tap uh, the capital costs of of setting up a massive amount of compute, compute that you might only need occasionally 
I, I, I think become problematic for just about anybody. Um, so yeah. Um, and then Yaddy's got a question about CO2, which actually brings me on, I, I think, to sort of to our kind of last, last sort of area. So we're living in interesting times. Um, two things uh, that are going on at the same time, obviously the pandemic uh, has been going on. And as we sit here with COP26 uh, happening while we're having this little conference here, obviously we've got a climate emergency. So again, I'm interested, your, your perspective, uh, what are you seeing and what are you experiencing as a result of the, the pandemic? What changes uh, uh, has it wrought, uh, both for um, uh, re rebellion and also perhaps more widely in, in, in your part of the world versus, versus ours? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think, well, one for, you know, for rebellion, we, we launched in, gosh, I think July of 2019, and then, you know, quarantine hit in March of 2020. Um, so we as a company have have grown, I, I, you know, I went from, we went from zero to, I think our headcount is 170-ish um, today, and we've been 100% remote. Um, so, and we're now, a few months ago, We've, we're sort of going back to, okay, we have three offices, we've got a London office, we've got our DC office, we've got a Seattle office, and the offices are open for business, employees are free to, to go to the offices, like I'm in the office today, just I had an in-person meeting and um, figured I'd, you know, be in, in this setting as opposed to you looking at my bikes behind me um, in my home office. <laughs> but uh, this is my home you, office, by the way. It's not a picture. I just want to tell you all. I, really I know that is a beautiful office. setting. That's, no, that's amazing. Um, so uh, so I, I think, you know, we are really recognizing that, hey, you know, we've grown this company with 100% remote workforce. And, you know, is there a need to commute? And, you know, with all the everything that comes with, with the commute, yeah. Um, or can we stay as, you know, the, the default is kind of remote and, you know, be where you need to be, right? And, and I, yeah. I personally am loving that approach. And I think you've also, kind of surprisingly enough, in the Defense Department, you know, there's been a lot of telework going on in, in government. Um, and there's a conversation now going on about, hey, how, you know, who do we let stay fully remote or who do we bring into the office, et cetera? Um, and I think yeah, the the question there um, around sustainability, I you know I do think like their their army for as an example is is doing a lot of work around electric vehicles right um, and how do you incorporate you know maybe it's not fully electric but how do you yeah. incorporate the electric component into ground vehicles yeah. um, to reduce that footprint um, and then there's a number of uh, different things going on around focus on climate and sustainability as a part of what the defense department's doing so you know i i, I think it's it's a topic that's you know like coming out of the you know maybe the pandemic helped drive that conversation forward right i know you had an interesting example david about you know kind of understanding the impact right yeah, so uh, if anybody wasn't around yesterday, I, I did some stuff on, on the IT department's CO2 footprint. And, and one of the things that stood out is that for a relatively, I, I sort of feel, small team of people in the overall scheme of things, our, our commute, daily commute distance was just over 6,000 kilometres, um, which is the same as going from Stevenage, where our head office is, to Ann Arbor. And... And I genuinely did those calculations five times because I was like, this has got to be wrong. And it's not. That's the round trip commute, actually. And some people live a good distance away and nobody, I don't think any of us, I certainly never thought about it. We never think about it. And, and actually, you know, a relatively small number of people suddenly adds up to a big number. Um, and that adds up to a measurable chunk of CO2. And uh, that's a really thought provoking moment uh, when you see that. Yeah. Our, our challenge will be to deal with it because, you know, uh, we've got to deal with it. There isn't a choice. We've got to deal with it. Um, so the question then is how. So, yeah, um, th these issues of of the remote working and the role of the office and the uh, the efficient 
you know, it's easy to say stop burning stuff, but actually it's a journey to stop burning stuff. But that idea of burn stuff only when you need to and don't when you don't, I think is not a bad, not a bad principle uh, uh, at all. Absolutely. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's up to each of us, right? I know, like for me, I, uh, I, I don't live very far from the DC office, but I'm kind of a, a proficient or a, a efficiency person. And so I'm conscious of, of my time and, you know, whatever. And I realized that of my three main ways to get to work, which are either drive myself, take the Metro, or I went out and um, I got an e-bike, right? Um, so yeah. I, I, you know, and believe it or not, when there when there's traffic, my e-bike is actually my fastest way to get to and from the office and right. zero carbon emission, right? So, yeah. So, yeah. So it's not yeah. a bad way to commute, right? Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Well, certainly, certainly, I think in spring and fall, and maybe early in the summer, I'm not. I'm not convinced uh, uh, about a Midwest <laughs> winter, but um, yeah, that's right. Uh, but but anyway, certainly, you, you have a lot more weather out there than we than we do um, in the UK. Um, look, uh, we've been talking a good forty five minutes. Um, so I did. I did clue this up right. I, I got one more question. I don't know if anybody else has got any more questions. Speak now, if you have further questions or thoughts that you you, you want to you, you want to bring to to chip and i shall just watch that for a moment to see i'm going to give him time to think about it because i did give him a question uh last week and uh i'm going to give him time to marshall his thoughts for a moment um anybody going to come in speak now envisions of somebody frantically typing um where are we right okay well so chip where are we five years from now? This is the last question, ladies and gentlemen. Where are we five years from now? <laughs> yeah, well, gosh, I really hope, um, and I know with your background, you may um, tell me that it's not all that you know opt uh, realistic of a hope, but I hope five years from now, we are talking about COVID-19 and the pandemic as a distant memory and that we're, we're not dealing with yet another uh, mutation or different strain or variant. Um, and I, and I, and I, all, I, you know, similarly, I really hope we're in a better place um, as a, on, on the climate change issue, right? J just in terms of moving from a lot of talk and a lot of yeah. discussion and actually seeing the you know the positive impact because I think one of the you know one of the things that I was just struck by and continue to think back on is when we all you know when as a world when we all sort of went into quarantine and seeing the images of how you know the animals and you know and like like if there was anybody's doubt yeah. in their mind that what is happening is human driven I think seeing those images during the pandemic, like that ought to put it out of your mind that it's not human driven, right? So uh, yeah. those are my, my two parting shots. Brilliant, thank you very much. Well, look, um, again, if we we're in the real, I'd be sitting there and asking everybody to stand up and uh, give Chip a round of applause for his questions and indeed his time. So I, I shall be a party of one in applauding and saying, Chip, thanks very much, it's fantastic. <laughs> fantastic to talk to you both times, both uh, last week and this. I hope that everybody out there uh, really uh, in, enjoyed this chat. Um, I certainly, I don't know whether you were able to stick around at all for a few minutes, Chip. I certainly gonna stick around for a few minutes because I'm gonna uh, uh, just see who is on their cameras in their little rectangles but thanks once again this is brilliant conversation i really enjoyed it i hope to meet you one day somewhere in the real i think that'll be absolutely fantastic be uh, great to to get you a beer and uh, yeah, and, and and have a further chat that would be fantastic i hope you all found it um thought provoking and illuminating thank you very much and i'm going to hand back to whoever i'm handing back to at nec thanks very much <laughs>